Welcome everyone, time for an update. We have a lot of different subjects to cover in today's video, as always. We're gonna be going over my portfolio. As you know, this story fund, this is the growth centric portfolio. I have a lot of different holdings in it and they all have commonalities. I think that they're, they're fast growing, rapidly expanding, uh, reliable income uh, uh, technology companies that have big addressable markets. They have big opportunities that they can take advantage of. Now, we're going to we're gonna do an update on this portfolio. So I'll let you know how the performance is. We'll benchmark it against the S&P 500. But another thing I want to talk about is this holding right here, PSTH, Pershing Square Tontine Holdings, however you pr pronounce that. It's Bill Ackman SPAC. It's the big SPAC, the SPAC to end all SPACs. We've been waiting for about a year for this. Investors have been excitedly and patiently waiting with Bill Ackman, the, the man himself, the legendary investor, for what he's going to select with the $4 billion he has for the SPAC. Now, as it turns out, the target for this was none other than Universal Music Group. And the reaction, I would say, to put it mildly, has been mixed. To be more uh, direct, I would say that it was overwhelmingly uh, underwhelming that the majority of people were underwhelmed by this uh, this selection. Now, in my opinion, just to give you a little synopsis, I'm a part of the group that was initially underwhelmed with this. And for various reasons, I think that a lot of the things that UMG is doing is being replaced by Spotify and different music apps like that. I think that UMG and the, the label itself, what type of value do they offer, right? They, they own music, they license it out. Uh, they used to do production and distribution of music, but now Spotify does that, and Apple Music does that. They help artists uh, get discovered through their algorithms. They help promote them in social media. They help them connect with the end user. I just see UMG as an older company that's that's a little bit, in my opinion, riding on the coattails of its previous business, what it previously did, which was really promote artists. So we're going to talk about the whole deal. I'll give some context and some information, some background of why Bill Ackman selected Universal Music Group. We'll unpack the whole situation and take a look at it. Another thing I want to look at is another holding in my portfolio, which is Twilio. This is a new addition. If you're familiar with Twilio, you're probably a software developer because that's who typically interacts with the company itself. It's a company that helps you automate all sorts of different interactions. For instance, anything where you're receiving automated text messages where they say like, hey, hit stop or type back stop right for us to stop texting you. That's probably done using Twilio. They automate all the text messaging, phone calls. They automate a lot of stuff that data centers do. They have web hooks and APIs and all sorts of analytics about that. And they have a really good business where they work with other businesses. So this is a B2B company. I added it into the portfolio. Twilio is a massively growing company and it's a pretty good size company. They're about a market cap of $50 billion and they revenue they revenue somewhere around 1.6 billion in the trailing 12 months. So they're a high revenue company and they're still growing 50 to 60% per year. So we're gonna be looking at Twilio and I'll be giving a further overview of why I'm buying this company. And then the last thing that I wanna talk about, this is a story that we've, that we've looked at before. This is a follow-up on it. The Colonial Pipeline hackers, these scumbags that they are financial, uh, they're financially driven hackers. They almost run like a business, but they run an illegal empire. And they hack, they follow, they look for vulnerabilities in US companies. They take over those companies by exploiting any type of weakness. And then they extort them into providing them money. And in this case, they, they took over Colonial Pipeline. They took over one of the main computers that was running it. Uh, they installed ransomware on it, and then they said, hey, in order to get your system back so you can run your company, you have to send us $4 million through Bitcoin. That was the situation here. The Colonial Pipeline CEO, he felt the best course of action was to do that, and so he sent the money. And then we hear this breaking news, which surprised me, that the U.S. government obviously is getting involved in this. When it comes to the Colonial Pipeline, right, this isn't like some small company that got a phishing scheme and... Uh, a little bit of a wire transfer hack. This was the colonial pipeline that supplies oil to 45% of the East Coast. Kind of a big deal. When you have a company that supplies oil to half the East Coast getting hacked and their, their business being disrupted, apparently the US government was not happy about this. So they recovered $2.3 million of the Bitcoin. Now, 
I know there's there's a whole subject of what does this mean for Bitcoin? It caused a big sell off. There's questions about the security of Bitcoin. I, I'm not going to go into all of that. That's for a different day, a different uh, a different video. But I do want to talk about what I think is the future of it's it's just the modern way of conducting war, and that is through code. It's not through bullets and ammo and missiles. It's through code. It's through installing malicious applications. It's through online security. Uh, companies that aren't taking enough effort in securing their uh, their premise and their software. And I think that this leaves ample opportunities for companies like uh, one of the ones that I have in my portfolio, CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike is a cybersecurity company that their entire stated goal, their entire purpose is to stop breaches, to stop things like the Colonial Pipeline from being extorted. So I'm going to go over the story, give my thoughts on it. We'll look at it. Uh, and go into greater detail on that. Now, if you like this type of content, as always, smash the thumbs up button that helps out the old YouTube algorithm. And if you want to really support the channel, you can check out the Patreon. There's a link in the description that helps support the creation of more content. Plus, you get access to a Discord community as well as we are, we're, we're making an app right now. We have a dividend tracking website, a bunch of different fun stuff. And of course, lots of exclusive content as well. So you can check that out. There's a link in the description. Now let's first go ahead and jump into the story fund. This is of course my portfolio. If you're new here, the goal of this portfolio, which is now at a value of 85,000, 7,800 in gains. The goal of this portfolio is simply put to outperform SPY. That's the goal of it. The goal is not to be low volatility, it's not to create an extra stream of revenue. It's not to be well diversified and hold up well in market downturns. That's not the goal of it. The goal is at the end of five years, at the end of 2025, to outperform the broader market. That's the simple stated goal of this portfolio. Uh, in order to do that, in order to give myself the best chance of accomplishing this feat, which is very difficult, is I'm selecting companies that I think have attributes where they're, they're likely to outperform the rest of the market. And I think if I select enough of those companies and diversify within that group, and I have a basket of companies that I think have qualities and characteristics that could outperform the market, I think I set myself up for a decent chance of doing so. The type of qualities that I look for are typically technology companies that have huge addressable markets. They have economic models that I think are superior to the normal type of economic model. A normal economic model for a company is you produce a product, you sell it, and then the customer comes back when they need more product. That is the normal economic model. That's not what these companies do. Many of them are subscription-based companies where their customers are billed on a routine basis. They're unlikely to cancel. And that, that creates a constant cash flow of money that can be reinvested into other opportunities. There's also an economic model in here that is usage-based. So like uh, you have Shopify. They have a usage-based economic model. Amazon has one with their AWS. The more you use it, the more you pay. The less you use it, the less you pay. Turns out people use their products a lot. So I focus on these type of companies that have a couple things in common. Even though they're completely different companies, like Netflix is all about entertainment. Adobe is all about creativity and creating uh, uh, art and media, right? Those are com completely different. I guess those are a little bit related, but Adobe is a different company than Netflix. PayPal's and payment processing, completely different than Adobe and Netflix, but all of them have similarities. The similarities are that they, they have a cloud-based economic model where they have customers residually paying them money. Almost every one of these companies has some type of subscription or usage-based payment model. So Microsoft has subscription, Adobe has subscription, Netflix has subscription, PayPal is a payment merchant. It's a little bit different. Salesforce has subscription, Twilio has a usage-based model. We'll be talking about that. So on and so forth. You go down the list and like 99% of these you know, all but a few have subscription-based models. Now, like I said, the goal of this portfolio is to outperform the S&P 500. I'm not factoring in volatility. And frankly, if you're investing in a portfolio like this, that's not diversified, that's concentrated into one type of company, you have to be completely comfortable with volatility because I benchmark this against the S&P 500. This is what it looks like. This is a volatile portfolio. For the better part of a year, I was outperforming the S&P 500. My portfolio is in blue, SPY is in red. So I was outperforming it and at some times I was almost doubling it, which at the time people would tell me, Joseph, that's easy to outperform SPY. All you have to do is buy tech companies. It's simple, that's all you have to do. This is like cheating, you're outperforming SPY so easily. Then of course what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened, the tech sell-off happened 
And a lot of the momentum investors that were doing call options and riding up a lot of the tech companies, they, of course, as momentum investors do, once the momentum started to fade, they, they abandoned ship. They went over to whatever was the next momentum play. So a lot of the momentum investors fled these type of growth, growth companies. And then you had, in combination of that, we have fears of inflation. And we have stocks going down as a result of that. So if I look at this article here, stocks close down as investors wait for inflation update. That's another concern that investors have. So we have a double whammy here. We have momentum investors leaving. We have inflationary fears, which technology companies are the, the big no-no. If you have inflation coming, get out of tech companies. No good to own tech companies if you have inflation. Now, on top of that, we also have the big recovery play. A lot of the oil companies, commodities, those are going through the roof. Well, again, people have, they've overall left the technology companies and have traded those for different plays. So this is what's happening. And right now, I dipped down quite a bit below the S&P 500. Just a month ago, I was at a 4.5% return while SPY was at a 14% return. But I've closed the gap a little bit. And now we're actually within 5%. So we're catching back up. In my opinion, if I was to give a prediction of what was going to happen, if we see inflation, this graph is going to look uglier for me. And there's a good chance that we'll see temporary inflation over the course of the summer. If it continues on to the end of this year and into next year, then I'm really in trouble because tech companies, like a lot of companies, will probably be hurt. But if inflation is somewhat temporary, if it starts to uh, simmer down a little bit at the end of this year, I think that, uh, that people will want back into these tech companies. Once they realize that there's no safe place to go with inflation, I think a lot of people are going to want to buy back into these type of companies. So that's the update. I think right now I'm underperforming SPY by a little bit. There's some events going on, but overall the companies are doing fine. These companies are growing like crazy. That's what I'm going to pay attention to for the next five years, because I think overall, over the long term, it's going to be how these companies perform, not how the economy does, not about inflation. It's not going to be the macro event with taxes or inflation or whatever it may be. Every three months is something different. In this case, I'm focusing on the companies. And I think with this group of companies and the ones that I plan on vetting and, and kind of feeding into the portfolio and adding in as new holdings, I think I'll have a very good chance of beating the S&P 500. But I can't see the future. That's why we're, we're looking at it every week and giving updates. But overall, right now, we're, we're a little bit behind. Now, let's go ahead and jump into the big news of the day. This is uh, the big news of the week, actually. This happened last week. But PSTH, Bill Ackman SPAC has finally found a target. And it's none other than UMG, Universal Music Group. That's the exciting, game-changing, biggest SPAC ever that we've all been waiting for. Now, we sat there patiently for a year. We, we know that Bill Ackman is a legendary investor. Uh, he, he runs an incredible hedge fund. He's made some incredible plays in the market before. And there was talk, there was chatter of companies like Stripe, innovative new payment solutions that are program programmatically led. Uh, they have APIs. They can integrate into websites like other payment solutions can't. Stripe would have been an incredible pickup. We heard about Plaid that connects banks together, right? Seamlessly without having to enter in banking information on your website. All sorts of different websites use Plaid. That would have been an exciting announcement to be able to own Plaid through PSTH. We heard about Airbnb. We know that one was off the table when they went public, but that was one of the ones that Bill Ackman talked about that maybe uh, it came up in the conversation that maybe it would be Airbnb. People would have been ecstatic for Bill Ackman to do Airbnb through PSTH. What do we get? We get Universal Music Group, UMG, the company that, as far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, the reason this company exists is just to own music, charge money for it, and copyright strike anybody that uses their product for any reason for uh, one second of it playing in the background in a video. That's what UMG does. That's the value that they offer. As far as I can tell, I have not had anybody explain to me what amazing value UMG is offering to its customers. What does this company actually do? It helps, oh, it helps with the production of music. What, you know, you need a mic to produce music now. There's so many cheap tools to be able to do it. There's different artists all the time that are now producing their own music at home because it's so easy to produce. So what value is UMG offering? Is it networking, 
getting their music into stores, nobody buys music at stores anymore. They get discovery through the algorithms on Spotify and Apple Music. That's how artists are getting discovered. If they want promotion, they pay for a banner ad or to be on a playlist in one of these apps. UMG is out of this. What type of value does UMG offer? As far as I can tell, the value that UMG offers is riding off the coattails of its previous success and just owning a big catalog of music. That's it. They just own a lot of stuff. And that stuff is, is valuable, but they're not doing any with anything with it to make it more valuable. So that's my first concern. I don't know what UMG really does. I haven't heard anything about it. No compelling argument of anything innovative or good that they're doing other than they just own a lot of music and they're making money because the streaming services are doing well. In my opinion, Spotify is where the value is. That's where the music discovery is. That's where the, uh, the helping artists get their name out is. That's where the social networking is. It's through Spotify and Apple Music. Those are the companies creating the value. So my an initial reaction, my reaction looking at this is disappointment. I was not, uh, I was not happy reading this news. Now, I don't know everything about UMG. I haven't read all the details about what they do and how they make money and what value they're offering. So I'm not going to sell out of it right now. I'm going to sit back. I don't see any reason to rush and sell out of this. Uh, I'm going to keep it in the portfolio, but I will be looking at if I really want to hold this company long term. And if I do think it's an exciting company that's actually going to offer value to customers in the long term. So having said all of that, I'm clearly not excited about this. This isn't an inspiring uh, company. UMG, again, I think is a company that has been riding off the coattails of its previous success. And most of the things that they previously did to offer value are replaced by Spotify and Apple Music. Putting albums into store, networking, uh, promotion, making music videos. People can do that in a variety of different ways right now. UMG, I don't think is that necessary. So let's go ahead and read into the context and the situation that made it so Bill Ackman ended up with UMG because it was not his first pick. This is uh, taken from a blog, a blog post from yet another value blog. So you can check that out if you want. It says, I think it's pretty clear what happened with PSTH. Remember that Ackman filed to raise PSTH in late May and they IPO'd in July 2020. At the time, Ackman was on the heels of absolutely uh, of having absolutely nailed the COVID trade, buying credit swaps when the market wasn't prepped for COVID, then selling them at a mammoth profit at the peak of fair. That was an excellent trade by, by Bill Ackman. He even went on CNBC and instilled a lot of fear in people during that trade. Don't know how that's legal, but he did it. While the market wasn't in full panic mode in late May in 2020, the future was still incredibly uncertain. Plenty of people still thought we were going to go into a depression from COVID. And many people thought that getting the vaccine by the end of 2021 would be optimistic. So just setting the scene, if we rewind to 2020, which I know none of you are wanting to do, but just mentally rewind to 2020, May of 2020, we were coming out of it a little bit. The vaccine was a huge debate how quickly they could get that rolling. People are saying it's going to take forever. Uh, it came a lot quicker and it's a lot more effective than we probably could have imagined. But the future was still incredibly uncertain at this point in time. This is when companies that right now, if they were back at that price, they'd be an absolute steal. Uh, I think JP Morgan was like a $280 or 280 billion uh, market cap. Now it's almost 500 billion. So companies were selling for half of what they are today. Disney was selling for like one, 110 at that point, right? Right above $100 a share. The future was still incredibly uncertain. Plenty of people still thought we were going to go into a depression from COVID. And many people thought that getting the vaccine by the end of 2021 would be optimistic. So Ackman raised that money at an absolute high thinking that he could go after a unicorn that had been hit by COVID. Airbnb was his first target, and it fit his investing thesis perfectly. He also owns Marriott, and that's another company that Marriott does not own the buildings that it operates in. It's just the brand. So it's similar to Airbnb, more similar than people think. It highlights the problem here. But then the market rallied furiously, and cheap cash was available in near unlimited quantities to basically every company. No one wanted to take Ackman's money. All these companies decided they didn't need it. There was cheap money with less strings attached floating around everywhere. And now it's been a year since uh, PSTH IPO'd. They only have a two-year lifeline. So the clock was ticking. Ackman found himself in a situation where every company 
had plenty of liquidity and they frankly did not need him to, to go to IPO. They didn't need his money. This UMG deal solves all of these Ackman slash PSTH problems. He's getting UMG at a good price and the business is likely to do well over time. So he's not destroying his reputation by doing this. Remember, one of the unique things about PSTH is that they have no traditional promote. This is something that was actually unique to Bill Ackman. In his SPAC, he doesn't get paid by promoting it. And a lot of the influencers, the financial influencers that run these SPACs, they use them as a way to monetize their celebrity personality. For instance, Shamath Palihapitiya gets paid promotional payments just for running the SPAC, just for being the person tweeting it out. He gets paid millions of dollars for doing that. And whether or not the company does well or the stock does well, he makes money either way. It's better for his reputation if the company does well, but he gets paid either way at the end of the day. So Bill Ackman with his SPAC didn't do that. He didn't take a promotional payment. But it says he can only make money if the stock goes up over time. So UMG was a safe bet. Buying UMG positions him for that and doesn't burn any of his credibility, like buying a super hyped EV company and hoping it would have a quick pop. More importantly, PSTH will have some cash left over, which will go into PSTH Remain Co. I think is what this is called. PSTH Remain Co. will effectively be a cash shell with no liquidation date. This is incredible for Ackman. He can keep this cash shell in reserves and pounce once a big opportunity comes up. Remember that Ackman made some of the literal greatest investments in history during the last two crises, GGP during the financial crisis and the credit swap trade during the pandemic. So Bill Ackman is very good at going in during a crisis and scooping up some good deals. But that is it in a nutshell. Bill Ackman tried to go for Stripe. He tried to go for Airbnb and probably tried to go for Platt as well. Those deals did not pan out because frankly, there's a lot of money floating around and those companies are completely fine. So what do we end up with a year after this SPAC? We end up with UMG, an uninspiring older company that in my opinion, you can try to prove me wrong. What value is this company really offering? What does it do to better companies or to better people's lives? Every single company that I'm invested in, I can go through any one of these holdings and quickly and easily detail out what value it offers to, to society or to customers or to their clients. I can easily outline the value of it. DoorDash offers people the opportunity to have a personal assistant. Just like if you were a an executive at a big company. They have personal assistants that do different tasks for them, right? They go pick up their dry cleaning. They go pick up lunch for them. DoorDash offers that to everyday people. You can be an everyday person, not a Fortune 500 CEO. And with DoorDash, you have a personal assistant. You can say, hey, I want to eat this. I don't want to have to go out and get it. So go pick it up for me. You know, I'll pay you a little bit. That is what DoorDash is doing, is they're democratizing personal assistants. That's something that's pretty incredible. You have Peloton. They make working out fun. Very simply, you have CrowdStrike. This company stops breaches, helps company avoid things like the Colonial Pipeline. It's very easy for me to go through my holdings and explain what value they provide. When I try to think of what value UMG is currently providing, crickets. I don't know. And again, I'll be open-minded. Tell me in the comments, what do you think UMG actually does that's relevant today, aside from just owning a lot of music? Because that's not providing value. Just buying music and then letting Spotify and Apple sell it really is not value. And if that's all they do, I think over time, the economics, it'll change. I think that Spotify will muscle UMG and they will show that they are the really, really the ones that are in charge because they're the ones that have all the leverage over the artists and the customers. They're the ones that have the big relationships. So I'll be open-minded, but again, you can prove me wrong and try to tell me what type of value UMG is currently offering. Now, moving on, let's go ahead and talk about a new holding called Twilio. This is a fast growing $50 billion market cap company that I just introduced into my portfolio. It has a 25 times multiple of price to sales. So it's a more expensive company. But when you have companies that are growing their revenue like this quarter over quarter, you have to pay up. You're not going to find these ones for cheap. Typically, they're just not they don't exist right now. So Twilio is a more expensive company. There's companies that are are more expensive than Twilio like Cloudflare. But I thought given the growth of this one and the opportunity and the leadership of it and the platform itself, it's one that I want to own. So let me go ahead and open up this interview. This is with the CEO of the company. This is in 2018. So he describes what the company does, and I think he does it better than I can. 
Well, it's really the continued success of our platform business model. As a platform, developers can use Twilio to solve a wide variety of problems inside of their companies and how their company communicates with their customers, whether that's voice phone calls in a contact center, whether that's text message alerts, even real-time video communications and things like Facebook Messenger. You can incorporate all those things uh, using Twilio. And so it's the broad breadth of things that developers can build on top of Twilio, coupled with our usage-based pricing model, which really aligns our success with our customers' success. So we get paid when our customers use Twilio more and build things on top of That's it. That's what the, the basic of the company is that it has a lot of communication tools, whether it's text messaging, phone calls, uh, emails, anything that can transfer messaging from a customer to a company, Twilio helps developers automate that so that they can use it for anything they want in the company. And he talks a lot about the, again, the economic model of the company. People don't look into this enough. How companies make money, like how they actually do the billing is very important. And the reason that I think Twilio has so much success is because of its usage-based model. I think it's I think it's modeled somewhat after AWS, how they how they bill you the more that you actually use their server. Twilio has the same type of billing and I think it's pretty incredible. So let's go ahead and dive further into this. Of, uh, of our platform. And so the combination of the breadth of things you can build as well as the alignment we have with our customers, that's the platform business model that has worked so well. I think a good example that people can relate to is the Uber model, right? Helping us users connect with their drivers by a by phone call. How big of a... She brings up she brings up Uber, but I get that her, she's trying to make a connection between Twilio and Uber, but uh, they're not at all the same economically. Uber is struggling um, to grow. It just has so many challenges that it faces that Twilio doesn't. For instance, Uber has to deal with traditional legacy government regulation like local jurisdictions. They have to deal with a lot of entry-level employees that are are they gig workers? Are they employees? There's lots of regulations that go on. Uber's facing all sorts of challenges that Twilio's not. Twilio's out there in the cloud, growing like a weed, and it's avoiding all the type of regulation problems that Uber is. And it's a far, it's a far faster growing company. Twilio's growing like crazy. It doesn't face any of the challenges. And I think that Twilio has a, a much better p potential down the road to have high amounts of free cash flow and profitability than, than Uber does. So Although I see some of the connection that she's trying to make, I think that there's some substantial differences between the two. Customer is Uber for you. Uh, Uber's uh, one of our largest customers. They represent about 4% of our revenue today. But we have many different companies on our platform, whether it's uh, Lyft and other rideshare companies, as well as uh, everything from Silicon Valley tech companies to Fortune 500 companies like major banks, insurance companies. In fact, one of the customers we noted on our Q2 call was U-Haul, which is not a company you typically think of as a software company. But every company is getting reinvented because of the power of software. And every company realizes that they, too, are a digital company now, whether your business is U-Haul, you have to reinvent yourself with software. And when they do, the software developers work at those companies bring Twilio in. I mean, the diversity of customers. I was just going to mention WhatsApp because I think one of the big questions around your IPO back in 2016 was that WhatsApp was almost 20% of your total revenues. See, that was a problem with Twilio when it IPO'd. It was very top heavy. WhatsApp being 20% of their total revenue. It was a company that had a good model, right? They, they knew they had a good product. But they're very top heavy, reliant on just a couple big customers. Well, they, he highlights, and again, this is in 2018. So rewind a couple years, things have changed a little bit, but he highlights even then how much they've diversified their revenue away from just a, a couple big players. Have you managed to spread that out a little more? Yeah, in the last year, we've diversified our revenue uh, substantially. So our top 10 customers, which used to represent about 32% of our revenue, now only represent about 17% of our revenue. And so we've diversified our revenue base. The top customers that represented 32 now only represent 17%. And that was in 2018 while growing our top line substantially. In fact, Q2, we posted 54% year-over-year growth in the top line, uh, reaching almost 600 million of annualized uh, revenue. So uh, we're really proud of the results, uh, both of growing the top line while also diversifying our customer base substantially. Uh, we were speaking earlier with David Kostin from Goldman about what has been a significant increase in capital spending by corporations in general, in part perhaps because of the tax bill. Do you think you're a beneficiary overall of that increased spending up 19% year-over-year for the first half? This type of question, 
I'll be honest, this, this type of theme, and it's not just from, it's not just from him, right? Not just him asking the question, but this whole theme of, oh, you grew, but it had to be because of the Trump tax cut. That's the reason, because that spurred more investment into your company. That's why the spending was up 19% or whatever. They're always looking for some macro economic factor or macro factor of why a company's doing well. Oh, this company did well because of the pandemic. This company did well because of the tax cuts. This is always the case. This was back in 2018. Twilio was growing like crazy, and they tried to explain the growth, or at least say, hey, this is in part because of the Trump tax cuts. Twilio kept growing. In 2020, now there's people going to say that they grew because of the pandemic. That's not why Twilio is growing. Twilio is growing because it's a good company. It offers a good product. Basically, every company wants to use their product or a version of it, and Twilio is the best at what they do. That's the reason that it's growing. It'll grow in spite of the Trump tax cut, in spite of the pandemic. It'll grow in 2021, 2022, and they will also try to attribute different reasons of its growth during then, but the truth is it's just a good company. Well, I think that every company, regardless of, of what they do, is, is always investing in their own growth and in their customer relationships. And so when you think about customer engagement, how a company talks to its customers, I mean, that's a source of, of growth for every company, whether, you know, in uptimes or downtimes, really that is the lifeblood of every single company because how... It says they have 40,000 customers. So very diversified. And again, this is in 2018. We will look at updated numbers right after this, but this is in 2018 you engage with your customers and what they think of those interactions, that is uh, the brand perception and that is the reality of the product delivery that companies have with their customers. So you think so, you can sustain 54% top line growth? Well, th obviously that's a great number. We're very proud of it. Uh, as numbers get big, it is harder to maintain top line growth at that rate, but we are very proud and we do think that our business model, the platform business model, is a unique business. It's not software as a service. It's got a lot of different attributes. It's not traditional uh, on-prem software. It is a new kind of software company and because of that usage-based model, we can sustain uh, a nice expansion rate and nice growth rates uh, well up into some big numbers. But uh, that said, you know, it's hard to tell how, how, how those numbers scale over time. How do you measure usage, just out of curiosity? What he keeps talking about the usage-based economic model. This is something that he's excited about because obviously it's, it's advantageous for both the customer and Twilio. It's this symbiotic relationship where as the company grows and expands, you don't have to charge them more. You don't have to come and renegotiate a contract. You naturally just get more and more money from that company. So this is working out really well for Twilio. And he, exp he expounds upon why, like how they do the billing. So he explains that. Well, how is that yeah. actually measured? It's uh, like phone calls and text messages and video sessions are measured in gigabytes. Uh, and our new uh, context center product, Twilio Flex, is measured in uh, the amount of time the agents spend using it. And so each one of our products, we break down into sort of the fundamental value uh, driver for our customers, and we bill for that. And what that does is it aligns our customer's success with our success very nicely. So that's it. That is the CEO in 2018 talking about the the way that they do billing and how it's aligned their company with the customer. One thing that he doesn't mention is that if you have a subscription and you're not using it, it gives you incentive to cancel it. But when it's usage-based, you have no incentive to cancel it if you're not using it, because if you're not using it, you're not paying it. So they have huge re customer retention and their net income per customer, the gain that they have per customer is substantial. So just a review, Twilio is a messaging platform. This is the website. If you go and visit it and you want to look at the products that they offer, we can look right here. If we go to products, they have everything from, let me zoom in a little bit. They have everything from messaging, voice, video, email, Twilio Flex, uh, cloud contact center. So they're, they're going into a little bit of the in contact there, the 5.9 territory. They're trying to compete with them and offer cloud contact center solutions, marketing campaigns. If you get e any type of email marketing campaign or text message marketing, it's probably from Twilio. They're the, the biggest player in that. Twilio Frontline, Account Security, lots of two-factor authentication services where they shoot you an email or a text message after you try to log in. That is from Twilio. So they offer all these type of solutions that you're seeing companies use all the time now. And of course, they're, they're expanding into video and email, SMS, WhatsApp, all the different chat services. They're expanding into all of that. Now, let's go ahead and jump into some more updated numbers because like I said, that uh, that interview was in 2000, it was late 2018, so the numbers were a bit outdated. Now let's go ahead and jump into the financial overview. This is of Q1 
Q1 of 2021. So this is their last report. Their highlights. Was it because of the Trump tax cuts? Is that the reason that they did well? Well, not according to this. Q1, they're up 62% year-over-year revenue. $590 million in revenue in one quarter. This company's taken in a lot of money. That's a lot of dough. Their first quarter total revenue dollar-based net expansion is 133%. So they're earning more per customer on a yearly basis. More than 235,000 active customer accounts. What was it before? 40,000? Was that the number? Now they have 235,000. This is pretty incredible here, the amount of growth that they have. And then they give guidance. Is Q1 just a fluke? Are they going to slow down in Q2? Not really. It says here that in Q2, they're guiding for 47 to 50% year-over-year revenue growth. So the company's fast growing. They outline that in a chart here. This is their quarterly revenue growth, and it's just incredible. They grew by 81%, 86%, 75%. 62%, 57, 46, 52, 65, and 62. It's slowing down a little bit. They can't keep 80% revenue growth year after year. That's that's going to become difficult after some time. No company can do that forever. Otherwise, they would quickly overtake Apple and Amazon. So clearly, they're not going to take, they're not going to keep 86% revenue growth every single year. It's going to decelerate a little bit, but this is still substantial revenue growth. And it gives a company a ton of revenue and a ton of opportunities to push other products amongst their various customers. So that's what they're seeing. They also talk about dollar base net expansion. It's always in the positive and it's at least 125%, 130. This is pretty incredible. They're earning more money from their existing customer base. And this is part of the, again, that, that awesome business model they have that's usage based like AWS. The more you use Amazon services, the more you pay. That's the same thing. As the economy expands, as companies use their services more, they're paying Twilio more and more. The top 10 customer accounts, this talks about the the diversification. When they started off again, they had 20% of their revenue. I think it was just with Snapchat or something like one app. Now they have their top 10 customer accounts only accounting for 12% of their revenue. So they've diversified away from their top 10 customer accounts, which is good. You don't want all your business tied to just a couple big customers. Otherwise, you end up in a situation like Apple and Intel, where they dropped Intel, and that's very bad for the company. So I view Twilio as a company that fits really well within the story fund. It is a fast-growing, stable, cloud economic business model that's based off of usage. They're obviously very good at managing the company. They have a good sales team. They have a ton of customers. Lots of diversification with their revenue. Even geographically outside of the U.S., they have about 30% of their revenue comes outside of the U.S. And the company has a a massive TAM. Everything is moving digital. Communication is such a key spot to be. Twilio is the clear leader in this industry. So I just think it's a good one to have. And at a $50 billion market cap, revenueing about $1.6 billion in the past uh, 12 months, it's expensive, but it's also growing incredibly fast. So these these high multiples that you're looking at, they will come down within a year once they double their revenue, right? Once they go from 50% revenue growth, 60% revenue growth, a couple times, these numbers are going to come down. So this is one that I'm happy to have in the portfolio, and we'll see what happens. Now, moving on, I need to jump into this news here. This is a follow-up. Apparently, the U.S. government was able And I think amazingly, I was very happy to read this news. They were able to retrieve $2.3 million from the scumbag extortionists that stole money from the colonial pipeline. So that's always welcome news. When the U.S. government, the DOJ or the FBI, whoever was involved in this, was able to retrieve a large part of their spoils, of their, um, you know, of their illegal corrupt activities, I think is a good thing. And I think that should be celebrated. So first of all, good job to anybody involved in that retrieving this money. But I do think that this paints a broader picture. This is just one, one brushstroke in a very broad canvas here. This is not a small problem, and this isn't a unique event, and I think this is going to happen more and more frequently over time. I think that the new type of war that we're facing, the new type of battles that we're facing, are not going to be so much fought with guns and bullets and missiles. It's going to be with code. That's where a lot of damage is going to happen. You can see the type of destruction that can happen with one hacking group and the Colonial Pipeline. This pipeline supplies oil to 45% of the East Coast, and they shut it down. That's, that's a lot of oil 
being shut down. That's disrupting a lot of people, millions of people's lives. The CEO of the company thought, sheesh, he looked at how long this would take to recover the systems. There's nobody that could do it manually. And he thought it would take too long to recover it without paying them the, them the ransom. So uh, he got things back on track. But unfortunately, that has the effect of funding these illegal activities. So the U.S. government is now involved. This has some broader implications on what does this mean for digital currency? What does this mean for Bitcoin? I'm not going to go into that. But I do think that the broader message here is that security with companies is becoming a more pressing and urgent concern. In fact, if we go to the interview of the deputy attorney general, I think she is, uh, she talks about the pressing need of this. And I want you to just keep in mind, just keep in mind in the back of your head, CrowdStrike and different cybersecurity firms, different investments like that, when you're hearing the deputy attorney general speak on this subject. Let me go ahead and play some of this. Ransomware attacks have increased in both scope and sophistication in the last year, targeting our critical infrastructure, businesses of all types, whole cities, and even law enforcement. Ransomware and digital extortion pose a national security and an economic security threat to the United States. The Department of Justice, working with our partners, is committed to using all of our tools at our, all the tools at our disposal to disrupt these networks and the abuse of the online infrastructure that allows this threat to persist. Now, she talks about the online infrastructure that allows these, these type of activities to go on. And I think you would be shocked if you have not read about how, how sophisticated these hackers are. It's like entire enterprises, like entire Fortune 500 companies that are, that, are, that are doing this. So they're well-funded, well-ran, and she explains how this actually operates. Ransomware attacks are always unacceptable, but when they target critical infrastructure, we will spare no effort in our response. DarkSide is a ransomware as a service network. You hear that? DarkSide is a ransomware as a service network. Software as a service, they're selling, they're literally develop. they have developers, they're developing ransomware software, and then they, they have it productized so that other people that are, you know, whatever they are, the, these hackers that they work with, they pay for that ransomware. They pay literally usage licenses, or they pay to be able to use that, that ransomware to be able to target other companies. They run this like a legitimate business. They have the same economic model as a cloud company, but these are illegal hacking organizations. It's pretty incredible how in-depth this goes. That means developers who sell or lease ransomware to use in attacks in return for a fee or a share in the proceeds. DarkSide and its affiliates have been digitally stalking U.S. companies for the better part of last year. So they actually developed the software and then whoever wants to use it, they might say, okay, whoever you successfully victimize, we want uh, 30% of the take, right? Whatever it might be. Plus you have to pay this fee to use it in the first place. That's pretty incredible. That's what's going on right now with different countries, wherever it's coming from, right? Uh, to attack US corporations. This is a serious problem. And if they keep paying, which the FBI has said, that almost in every situation, they are just paying the ransom to get their company back on track. They're funding these empires. They're funding these businesses. So this is not going away. And again, keep the cybersecurity firms like CrowdStrike in the back of your head when you're listening to her talk. Later on in this, she's literally imploring uh, companies to invest in their security. In this heightened threat landscape, we all have a role to play in keeping our nation safe. No organization is immune. So today, I want to emphasize to leaders of corporations and communities alike. The if, I was a, if I was a CrowdStrike salesperson, right, and I was going into a board meeting and I was wanting to, to present them the software to a company, a potential customer, I would literally just, just clip this part of it and I would broadcast that on the TV and just say, hey, uh, before we get into the, the pitch here, let me go ahead and just play this for you. This is what I'd play. The threat of severe ransomware attacks pose a clear and present danger to your organization, to your company, to your customers, to your shareholders, and to your long-term success. 
So pay attention now. Invest resources now. Failure to do so could be the difference between being secure now or a victim later. Okay. Have any uh, questions after that? Really, that's all you have to do is play that. I mean, it's the deputy attorney general saying that you have to invest in cybersecurity. The Colonial Pipeline, to give you an idea of how poor their security was, their level of security was, was a VPN that had a username and password. That was it. That was all the hackers had to get past. There's no two-factor authentication, no secondary authentication of any kind. Once they got the username and password, they were in. For reference, for context, I use better security on every single one of my accounts. On my Amazon account, I use better security than the colonial pipeline that supplies oil to half the, United, half the East Coast of the United States. So companies are wholly inadequate in the level of security that they're using for their business. And I think this is going to be changing over time as more and more stories like this and more victims come out. This isn't the last victim. It's going to continue to happen. And it makes me sad when this happens. It makes me frustrated, but it also makes me happy to be invested in, in a company like CrowdStrike because it's either going to be CrowdStrike or another cybersecurity company that really steps up and offers the solutions to this type of problem. The problem is not going away. And one of these firms is going to be the solution. So that's my thoughts on it. This makes me feel good about being invested in CrowdStrike and companies that hopefully can stop this. Now, that's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And be sure to subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one.